Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you a very interesting feature coming in .NET 8 called Frozen Collections. Now this is something I'm very positive you will be using, I'm certainly going to be using it because it delivers in a promise that many of the collections we currently have don't. If you like that of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, ring the notification bell and for more training check out nickjapsas.com. Now before I move on I just want to quickly let you know that I'm running my two-day in-person workshop from Zero to Hero effective testing in C Sharp in several conferences this year. For now the announced ones are NDC London, .NET Days in Romania and NDC Oslo with NDC Copenhagen and NDC Porto being announced very soon and I'm very happy to say that NDC is actually giving me a ticket to give away to any of you for for any of the NDCs you'd like to attend, so click that link in the description to sign up for the giveaway. In those two days we're covering unit testing, mutation testing, integration testing and performance testing and we're setting the right foundation and showing the best practices that you should be using when you're testing your .NET projects. Speak with your manager and I really hope to see you there. Alright, so what are frozen collections? What is that name frozen? Because it sort of sounds like immutable, but what exactly is it? I'm going to go in this project and this is a console application, by the way, which as you can see over here is using the .NET 8 SDK. I have the alpha installed, which has been out for a few uh, weeks now. And as you can see, .NET 8, and if I compile the project, it is using the .NET 8 version, the alpha over here. So as you can see, it is the right thing. And now we have a couple of new types. The first one is the frozen set and the other one is the frozen dictionary. Those are the two collections we're going to be looking at. Now to correctly compare it with what they try to replace, I'm going to first create a list because I will start with the set first. So consider the following list. We have a list with one, two, two and three. And this list, obviously the whole point of a list is you can get something out of it, you can remove it, you can uh, change it, you can, you can do anything with a list. It's a fully mutable list of data. Now what you can do is you can actually create a hash set out of a list. You don't have to create a hash set out of a list, but I just want to show you a bit of an interesting behavior of hash sets, because ultimately the frozen set is sort of replacing a hash set. So I'm going to create that and then quickly add a read line here and then just debug this to show you what happens. So in the list, as you can see here, we have one, two, two, and three. But the moment I create a hash set out of a list, then I have three items in here, one, two, and three. That is because a hash set is actually containing unique data. The way it works is the value you're adding in will be hashed and that's how it is added in that set, hence the name hash set. And the reason why a hash set exists in the first place is so you can have a collection of data, of unique data in this case, with which you can actually check if something exists in the set, you can add something in the set and you can remove something from the set. And the reason why a hash set is a very interesting value proposition is because both add, remove and check if something exists are an O1 operation, meaning that it doesn't matter how big the set will get, you will always do these operations in constant time. And that's because you just hash the value and you know exactly where it will be no matter how big the collection is. But of course the thing with the hash set is that I can go here and I can say for example remove and I can use the remove method or use the remove where method to remove data. Now if I wanted immutability into the mix then I might want to use the mutable hash set. So I can say list dot to immutable hash set and this logically will have the same functionality as the hash set so you can add, get, and remove. And now just because it is an immutable hash set, you might think that, oh, it can't change, so it will only have a contains method. But the thing is, immutable hash set has both an add and a remove. Now, the reason why that's the case is because you can add or remove data from the hash set, but you never mutate the original hash set. You always get a new one constructed back. And to have this functionality behind the scenes, this is using an AVL tree. Now, the problem with that is that an AVL tree has an O log n time complexity, meaning that as the data gets bigger, it's not going to be as fast as something like a hash set. The benefit is you can't change it. At least you can't change the original hash set. But again, every add or remove operation tries to be efficient when doing it but it does allocate more memory and it is slower. So what we're gonna get now in .NET 8 is a frozen set. So I can say list dot to frozen set over here and now if I go to frozen set and I try to use its methods it doesn't have as you can see over here neither an add 
or a remove method. You just can't mutate it. There is no add and there is no remove. All you get is contains, which is ultimately what you want to check in this situation. And then you have things like overlaps, is subset off, is superset off. So you can do comparisons with other sets very, very efficiently. Now you might be thinking, okay, what is the trade-off? Because we have this now, but why couldn't we have this earlier? And what's the benefit of this? Well, I'm going to show you by adding some benchmarks here. Now, I've already written the benchmark. You can always grab the code from the description and try to play around with this yourself. But what I have here is I create all the original data in a list over here with a seed. So it's always the same data. And then I have a middle point and I'm using that middle point to retrieve data out of that set. And then I have the frozen set. And then what I'm checking is initialization of the hash set, the immutable hash set, and the frozen hash set, all using the extension methods of the two. And then I check the contains, which is the main thing I care about. I could also check add and remove, but those don't exist in frozen set. So it's out of the question. So all I'm going to do is just say release mode over here and then go here and run my benchmarks. So let's say benchmark runner dot run set benchmarks and let's see what we get back. All right, so results are back and let's see what we have here. So as you can see over here, the original hash set is the fastest in terms of creation. It is nine microseconds and it's around 17 kilobytes worth of memory. The immutable hash set is way longer, 178 microseconds and 56 kilobytes of memory. And then the creation of the frozen set is 84 microseconds, so still almost 10 times on the original hash set, but then less than half the time of the immutable hash set, but it is by far the most memory expensive. Now, that is by design, because the whole point, the whole promise of this is that you do that in initialization for things that are not supposed to change. So you preload this data on startup and then you keep reusing it. So it wouldn't really be a problem both in the time or the memory because the whole design of this is do it early and don't touch it because you can't touch it. And then once you do that, then here's where the thing actually delivers. The hash set contains is 2.7 nanoseconds, but the frozen set contains is 1.8 almost half. So as you can see, you're getting a solid performance boost for something that is supposed to never change. I should also point out that the mutable hash set is slowest in terms of contains, and it is supposed to be. It uses a tree, it's a different thing. So clearly a very solid performance boost if you want to use a set. Now what I want to do is I want to show you the other thing that is coming. And you might have seen this already, but now let's say I have a dictionary. It is the same concept. It's about mutability. It's about not being able to change anything about that construct. So previously we had the immutable dictionary. By the way, I intentionally left immutable list and immutable sorted sets because those are different things. It's not comparing apples to apples. And it's the same reason why I didn't add the read only list in here. It's because read only list is just a view over the list and you can still change the backing list and the read only construct will change. So we have a mutable dictionary and now we can also have a frozen dictionary. So to frozen dictionary, here you go. And the concept is the same with a mutable dictionary. You can still do things like add a value or add range or remove value or remove range. With a frozen dictionary, you can't do any of that. All you get is a lookup and that's it. You also have another method. We're going to take a look at that in a second, but I want to run a similar benchmark for this piece of logic to show you how that compares as well. Here we go. So I have a dictionary benchmarks class over here and it's the same thing. I have a dictionary, immutable dictionary, which is still using an AVL tree for the keys. And then I'm doing the same thing with the middle. I'm trying to get a value and let's see how it compares both in construction over here and also in contains, which is one of the things you can do, contain keys. Both of the things actually have that and also retrieval. All I'm gonna do is the same thing as before, benchmark run, and let's see what we get. Now, while this is running, I do wanna point out that this is still actively in development and it can only get faster. I don't think we're gonna see any degradation. So just to use this as this is where we're starting, it can only get better. All right, so results are back and let's see what we have here. So as you can see now, same thing as before. The immutable dictionary is the slowest to create, but it is more memory efficient than the frozen dictionary. And the frozen dictionary is faster compared to the immutable dictionary. But I do want to point out that, again, this should only be done on startup and cached. Don't treat this as a benchmark for how this is supposed to perform. This initialization 
is supposed to happen once in the beginning and then leave it. But once you do that, check this out. The immutable dictionary contains key 14.4 nanoseconds, while the frozen dictionary, 2 nanoseconds basically flat, which is very, very impressive. And the immutable dictionary, 17.3 for the get, 2.4 for the get in the frozen dictionary. It is so, so much more efficient because I'm not really using hash sets so much, but dictionaries, this will come in clutch. And now this is the point where I would just wrap up the video and finish, but I can't do that. So instead, I'm going to put a disclaimer saying, I'm a professional idiot. Don't do this unless you really know what you're doing. But if you really know what you're doing, then check this out. Obviously, like I said, frozen dictionary, we can't change it. So if I try to get two and I try to set the value to three, as you can see here, it says it's a read only reference. You can't really do anything with this. So clearly we cannot change what the value of that entry is, or can we? <laughs> what I'm going to show you is very unsafe unless you really know what you're doing. Do not do this. I want to re-emphasize, but you might have spotted a little method in here called get value ref or null ref. Now, this might not really mean anything to you, but this naming sounds familiar to me because in the collection Marshall class, there is a method called get value ref or value. And the way this is described is that it gets either a ref to the T value in that dictionary in that case, or a ref null if it does not exist. And the ref null is another thing you can check using, I think the unsafe dot is null ref or something. Yeah, here we go, it's this. So what this can do for you is give you a ref to a value in the frozen dictionary. And what I know by trying stupid things is that if I say ref var value equals ref unsafe and yes this is very unsafe do not do this unless you really know what you're doing as ref and i say in frozen dictionary get ref value for two here here we go then what i can do is say value equals 10 and i'm gonna just quickly put a right line here and debug this code and let's see what happens all right so application is running so i'm gonna step over this create the frozen dictionary as you can see here are the values one with one two with two three with three, exactly as you'd expect it. Then we get a ref var on that value. So we have the value two because we retrieved using the key two. And then if I set that to 10 and I check the frozen dictionary, which is immutable, then I just change that to 10. So there is a bit of a loophole if you really wanted to mutate the value. Very unsafe, unless you really know what you're doing, don't use this. But since this is a ref value, if I go here and I change this to be a string on the left, and the value be a value type, which in this case, it's an integer, it's a struct. And I say that the key is two and the value is 10, even though this is a value type because I have a ref to it. If I debug this code, then as you can see before any change, it is like I showed you before, one, one, two, two, three, three. And then I get the value, I change it. And in the dictionary, the value is changed. Super unsafe. But if you really, really, really know what you're doing, you can have a frozen dictionary with very efficient lookups. And in your code behind the scenes, if it really, really, really needs to happen, you could still change the value. Now, I'm not going to warn you again. I warned you like five times already. I wanted to raise this though, because it's a very interesting aspect of this thing. But what do you think? Do you like that Microsoft is going towards that direction with the immutability thing? And how does it feel to have immutable read-only and now frozen? And yes, frozen to a degree means something, but does it mean what everyone just assumes it means? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks next to my Patreons for making videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.